Hello everyone. Today we're going to be talking about tornadoes, lightning, heat, and cold. In general, just a severe weather, uh, basically most severe weather incidents besides hurricanes. We'll be talking about those next week. So severe weather causes about 75% of yearly, yearly deaths and damage from natural disasters. So uh, the majority of deaths due to natural disasters are severe weather events. More people uh, are killed usually by severe weather events than the mega killers like earthquakes um, or volcanoes or mass movements all combined. From uh, 1980 to 2009, for example, U.S. had 96 weather-related disasters causing more than $1 billion each and damages totaling more than $700 billion. So severe weather is by far the most lethal and the most costly form of natural disasters. And so here's a chart that shows us deaths due to severe weather in the United States from 1977 to 2011. We have the heat, we have, sorry, we have the, we have the event over here and the average number of yearly deaths. So in total, uh, severe weather, including hurricanes, results in about 559 fatalities per average year, which is a lot. Year after year, that adds up. So Severe weather is responsible for most deaths. I think it's like the leaky faucet, right? It's not gushing. And so uh, a gushing faucet, you know, it's like, oh, there's so much water coming out of it, but you turn it off quickly. Or a leaky faucet, it just drips and it drips and it drips. So a small number of deaths by this event, small number of deaths by that event, but it just keeps on occurring. And they accumulate, they add up. Surprisingly, the most lethal form of severe weather is heat. Most people wouldn't think that heat is the most lethal form. In winter, uh, storm or the cold, and flood, tornado, hurricane, and lightning comes in last. So it's very interesting. You think, well, how is heat so lethal? Well, we'll talk about that as we go forward. So here's a map of the United States showing the frequency of severe weather events by state. Uh, so the, the, the shade indicates the number of events per um, uh, number of events. And so we have, uh, you know, this like peach color, it's one through eight. This, you know, light orange, nine through 16. It's beige color, 17 to 24. Red, 25 to 32. And this crimson is 33 to 42 um, events, severe weather events. And you can see that this part of the country has the most frequent severe weather events. The question is, why? You know, and we'll answer that question as we go on. But, you know, these, these uh, so you look at, you know, so they have the type, disaster type broken down. All right, so all different types, of number of events, percent frequency, percent damage. So normalized damages, see tropical storms, hurricanes are by far the most destructive uh, and the cause the most damage. But outside of hurricanes, you have heat waves or droughts. Well, how are heat waves and droughts so destructive? Well, heat waves and droughts interrupt agriculture. And there's a lot of loss in productivity through agriculture. And people can't be as productive, you can't work, you stay inside. Uh, and so that limits productivity, heat uh, as well. So that's costly too, that's because that's an opportunity cost. If you can't go out and work and, and generate money, that's money lost. So the first form of severe weather we're gonna talk about is cold. So, uh, most recent, one, a fairly recent example of extreme cold and how devastating it can be was in the winter of 2012 and 2013. So there was an extremely cold, extremely cold spell in Central and Eastern Europe during that winter. Over 600 people perished. Now, it wasn't the cold itself per se that killed these people, but it was the lack of infrastructure. So 
Eastern European, those, those countries are, are part of the former Soviet bloc. So they were countries, they were, part, they were once part of the Soviet Union, which collapsed in 1991. And so those, those countries are still developing. Uh, they're, they're, not, um, they're not ranked high necessarily on the democracy index or you know, have a large GDP. So what happened is there's large amounts of snow. These houses got snowed in. They didn't have the infrastructure to clear the snow, to get food and supplies into these people, and these people couldn't get out. So these people, unfortunately, it sounds terrible, but they ran out of food and they ran out of heating fuel. So either wood or oil, whatever. And so they starved and they froze. And these poor people, it's a terrible way to go. But um, so it was the lack of infrastructure that was really responsible for these deaths. If this would have happened in the United States, this number of people would never, would, would not have died. So you can see here has the temperature departures from the norm. So in, in from January 21st, uh, sorry, 25th to February 14th in this area, there's some places that it was 20 degrees Fahrenheit below the typical norm. So that's, that's really cold. That's really cold. And it's all due to a disruption in the, uh, in, the, in the jet stream. So the jet stream usually goes down here. It dips up. Um, I'm sorry. The jet stream usually flows this way. But there was this high pressure system developed here that blocked it, caused the jet stream to move further north and come down. And the cold north air from the north comes down to wherever the jet stream is. And that's why they had that cold spell is that dip in the jet stream. Now, even if it's not that cold, you have to be careful because if it's just, you know, kind of a little bit cold and there's, a, there's some significant wind, then uh, the actual, the, uh, I guess, what is it? The, the wind chill temperature or the effective temperature could be cooler than the actual temperature. As wind blows past, it removes the air that's right around your body. And as your body loses heat, it warms the air right next to you, increasing the temperature of the air right next to you. And once that air is warm right next to you, you lose heat more slowly because the rate of heat flow is proportional to the temperature difference. That's how a blanket works, right? It traps warm air close to your body, and that warm air is held next to your body by the blanket, so your body doesn't lose heat because the temperature difference between your body and the air around you under the blanket is very small. However, with the wind blowing, as your body loses heat to the air around you, the air is constantly being, uh, being moved away. And so, and so your body just, it, it just keeps, it loses heat at a faster rate. And so you can see here, this is the wind speed increasing this way. This is the temperature. Uh, so this is low increasing this way. So let's say the temperature at 10 degrees, 10 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty cold, right? But if there's a wind, a uh, wind speed of 25 mile per hour, the effective temperature is negative 11 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, which is bitter cold. And when we have these regions shaded, or once you can get frostbite, okay, so, so here in this region, this is kind of the lighter blue. You have frostbite in 30 minutes. This region, 10 minutes. In this region, you have frostbite in five minutes. Now, where you're most prone to frostbite is your extremities, like the tips of your toes, the tips of your fingers, your nose, your ears, because those places get blood last. Your body gets cold. It conserves blood to your core to make sure that your internal organs stay warm. And what frostbite is, is basically your cells become so cold that the water inside them freezes. Now, whenever water freezes, it expands. And so whenever the water inside your cell freezes, it expands and it ruptures your cell wall, killing the cell. So whenever you get frostbite, the tissue that's frostbitten is dead and it can't recover. That's why it turns black. And so if you get frostbite, you have to have that tissue amputated. So it's a serious matter. You should uh, always be leery of, of having exposed extremities whenever you're going out into the cold. 
into to the cold or in, especially if it's windy and cold because frostbite is no laughing matter. So some winter storms. So in the Eastern US, we had what was called the storm of the century in 1993. Uh, so there's an, an immense cyclone that covered the area that ran from Cuba up to Canada between March 12th and 15th. Killed 270 people with more than $8 billion in damage. And there's a large trough or dip in the jet stream that caused the collision of the cold air from the north with, um, with uh, so we had low pressure, warm, moist air moving north from, uh, sorry, moving north from, from the Gulf of Mexico to the south. In the fast moving frigid Arctic, Arctic air moving south from the north in rain, uh, rainy, snowy, eastward moving air. And all those three air masses, they collide and form fronts. It forms a, a, a frontal cyclone that rode up the jet stream, dumping tons of snow. So here's the, here's the trajectory or the track of that storm. So here's it rode up the jet stream. So the, the jet stream probably was like that. So you had this air coming up this direction, this air coming down this direction, and you had this air coming down this direction. They all collided, forming a front and a frontal cyclone that moved up the jet stream. So one way we track storms is through Doppler radar. So Doppler radar allows us to measure the relative velocity between two objects. So this is how a radar guns for police uh, work. Uh, they measure the speed of cars or in sports, the measure of speed of a ball. Uh, now, using radar, sends out radio frequencies. And therefore, those radio frequencies bounce off of something that's moving. The frequency of the reflected radio frequency is changed. If the object is moving away from you, uh, the frequency of the radio wave is lower when it comes back. If it's moving towards you, the frequency is higher. And the speed at which the object is moving determines how much the frequency is shifted. So that's how the Doppler effect works. And so what we do is we send out from radar stations radio waves into the atmosphere. Now, if there's precipitation, snow, ice, or rain in the atmosphere, the radio waves will be reflected off of that precipitation and come back to the radar station. Now, how much of that energy, that radio wave energy comes back, tells us how much precipitation is in the atmosphere. If we get a really strong reflection, that means there is a lot of precipitation in the atmosphere. So that's how they get the color, the intensity. It's how much energy is coming back to the radar station. Okay. And then they're able to track the motion by determining how the frequency of the radio waves uh, comes back. So if the radio waves frequency is, is increased, that means the precipitation is moving towards the radar station. If it's decreased, it means it's moving away from the radar station. Okay. So the Doppler radar allows us to track the intensity and the, and the, and the speed and the speed and direction or the velocity of precipitation. Also, I use microwaves. Radio waves and microwaves are close in frequency. So um, Doppler radar allows for life-saving advanced warnings because we can see which direction these storms are warning, uh, moving and project where they will be in the future. So blizzards are a strong cyclone, so a strong storm, frontal um, cyclone, that is with wind speeds of at least 60 kilometers per hour and below freezing temperatures, and they feature blowing, falling snow. So a blizzard is any, any, any cold, uh, cold storm. So a storm in cold weather, below freezing temperatures where the wind speeds greater than 60 kilometers per hour. So even though the winds might be very fast, the cyclone itself, the storm itself could travel very slowly. So these storms can just hover around certain areas and dump tons of snow. In the northeastern United States, January 6th, 8th, 1996, a blizzard from Canada dropped record snowfalls on Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and New Jersey. The wind speeds uh, were exceeding 80 kilometers per hour and it killed 100, uh, 154 people. So then it was followed by immediate warming because um, well, just temperatures warmed and there was heavy rains and all that snow that melted uh, caused destructive flooding. 
the ice storms are, are destructive too, because what happens is um, whenever the precipitation falls of snowflakes or ice, it can accumulate on objects and add weight. Um, and then and that weight can cause structures to fail or trees to fail. So what happens is as precipitation with high in the atmosphere, which is either snow or ice because it's cold up there, as it moves down, it can pass through a warm layer of air that can cause the precipitation to melt. And then if the rain enters below freezing layer of air that's near the ground, it refreezes, it refreezes to sleet. However, if the rain is not in that below freezing layer for long enough, it becomes super cool. It doesn't freeze, but as soon as it comes in contact with the ground or a solid object, it freezes. That's called freezing rain. So freezing rain is when rain hits the surface, hits the surface, and then freezes on that surface. And so it forms a coating of ice. And those, the freezing rain is very destructive because it just coats uh, uh, surfaces with layers and layers of ice, adding a lot of mass to them, potentially causing them to fail. There was a Canadian ice storm in early January 1998, 80 hours of freezing rain, 25 people died from hypothermia, $70 billion, $7 billion of damage, and the power system collapsed under, mess, uh, under the immense weight, so the, the transmission towers hold the cables collapse. So normally, if it's, you know, if it's just raining, so up high in the atmosphere, it's snow, and then the snow comes out, enters warm air, it melts and falls as rain. And with, um, with sleet, the snow comes down, there's a layer of warm air, which it melts, there's a layer of cold air near the surface, which it freezes into an, uh, a pellet of ice, and that falls as sleet. In snow, there's no warm layer, it just falls all the way down to snow. Freezing rain, however, as the snow falls down, it melts, it enters a very co a cold layer of air, but it doesn't freeze before it hits the ground. It hits the ground and then it freezes. That forms freezing rain. You can see these high voltage towers, these transmission towers, are under the massive weight of the ice. They collapsed in St. Bruno, Quebec, January 10th, 1998. It shows you how much weight that ice added to these towers. And we also have lake effect snow which lake effect snow is common along the eastern shores of the Great Lakes. What happens is cold air moves over the warm waters of the lakes, so it increases the temperature of the air so it can absorb more water vapor. And then as soon as the air moves out from over top of the lake, it's over the cold land again, where the air cools and uh, the saturation humidity drops, the relative humidity increases and all that water vapor it held, it's dropped as snow. And this is likely, they're most likely during uh, late fall, early winter, whenever the water in the lake is still relatively warm. Also occurs elsewhere around the world where we have large lakes. So this, as air moves, it was warm by the warm water and it becomes very humid, it moves over the cold land, it cools, and its relative humidity hits 100% and all the precipitation falls out. So here you can see the winds going this way. And you can see it collecting that water vapor and then dropping it all out as snow. That's that lake effect snow, which is pretty, pretty, pretty crazy. So this is the seasonal fall, uh, snowfall forecast, say for example, 2004, 2005. And this is in, um, this is in inches. So this, this area up here, upstate New York, is over 100 inches, which is a ton of inches. That's a ton of snow, right, for a year. 100 inches, 100 inches. It's over eight feet of snow in a year. It's a lot of snow. And so but that's the lake effect snow. So it drops off with distance away from the lakes. So then we move on to thunderstorms. So how do thunderstorms work? Well, the air temperature normally decreases upward from the surface. Okay, we, we know that because the, the pressure is lower, so the air expands and it exactly cools. And so for humid air, it cools at about a rate of six degrees centigrade per kilometer. So that's the moist 
lapse rate. Remember the, the dry lapse rate is about 10 degrees centigrade per polymer. If that lapse rate is any greater than six to 10 degrees centigrade per, per, per kilometer, the atmosphere is unstable, which means that the air the uh, closest to the surface is less dense than air above it. And whenever you have, uh, and that's because it's warm and humid, uh, that's what makes air less dense. If you have less dense air beneath denser air, that less dense air rises. And so whenever that rising warm, moist air moves up higher into the atmosphere, the water, uh, we know that its temperature decreases because of adiabatic cooling. So the saturation humidity of the air decreases, causing the relative humidity to increase, and eventually it hits an elevation or an altitude, sorry, an altitude where the uh, relative humidity is 100%, and as it rises any further, all the water vapor begins to condense out. And whenever that water vapor condenses out, it releases the latent heat of vaporization to the air around it. And so that provides energy to the upper atmosphere, the reason that heat. So that warms the air in the upper atmosphere, causing it to expand, making it less dense, making it want to rise. And so it causes the air to rise upward with more vigor, which causes it to pull more air in. So what happens is you have this layer of warm, so here's the surface, this layer of warm, moist air, and it begins to rise. And as that warm, moist air rises, water vapor begins to condense out. And as it condenses out, it releases the latent heat of vaporization to the air around it, which warms this air, warms this air, causes it to expand, make it more buoyant, so it wants to rise with more vigor, so it begins to rise with more vigor. And as a result, rising air creates low pressure. And the more vigorously this air is rising, the lower the pressure, which causes air from higher pressure regions over here, to flow towards it. Now this air is warm humid air. So now more warm humid air is being supplied. That warm humid air rises, cools, water vapor condenses, releases heat, causes this air to rise with more vigor, lowers the, the pressure even more, causes air to flow in even faster. So it creates this positive feedback. And as more and more air goes up and water vapor comes up, it, you know, it's building these clouds. And and the cloud top gets higher and higher and higher as a storm, as a storm builds. The clouds are nothing but water particles in the atmosphere. So here are the updrafts, the warm human air rising. And up here begins the water vapor begins to condense out. And then enough water, there's enough water uh, droplets in the atmosphere that the weight, the, the, the updrafts can no longer support them. So the water uh, precipitation begins to fall and it brings some of this cold, drier air down with it. So now you have a strong updraft of warm, moist air, which is taking the energy to the storm, which is the latent heat of vaporization in the water vapor. And then you have the cold drafts coming down with the, with the uh, precipitation. Now eventually these cold drafts, when they come down, they flow out in both directions and they choke off the warm updraft. And they, and they, they cause the storm to, to, to fizzle out. So this is called a single mass air storm, or just one mass of air. This is a typical thunderstorm that you'd experience on a late, like a summer afternoon, right? Because what happens is during the summer, as the sun's up on a warm day, the, the air along the surface is becoming warmer and more humid. And it becomes, it gets to the point where the air at the surface is so warm and so humid that its density is so low that it begins to rise up then it, it, it starts this process and it eventually chokes itself out. So the early stage of the thunderstorm requires a continuous supply of rising warm, moist air, because that's what's providing the energy, latent heat of vaporization in the water vapor, right? And that, so that, uh, that uh, updraft causes the clock, uh, bringing the water vapor up and condensing out causes the cloud mass to grow. The mature stage, the upper level precipitation begins when ice crystals, water droplets become too heavy for the updrafts to support. And so the precipitation begins to fall downward, pulling the cooler, drier air from up higher in the atmosphere down with it. So then we have these updrafts, downdrafts side by side, creating very gusty winds between them. 
horizontal winds between them, heavy rains, thunder, lightning, and hail. Then finally, at the dissipating stage of the downdrafts drag so much cool, dry air down that they choke off the updrafts of warm, moist air, cutting off the fuel source for the thunderstorm, the source of energy. Then you have frontal cyclones, uh, or uh, you have these uh, frontal thunderstorms. So frontal th thunderstorms are different because they form, these are thunderstorms that form along a front, the boundary between two air masses. So you can see this is a cold front right here, and this very concentrated precipitation uh, is because if you have, an, you have a front, you have cool air, you know, warm humid air, a low pressure normally develops along it. The air begins to move in towards that low pressure normally, it begins to rotate. The front separates into a, a cold front, sorry, a warm front and a cold front. So a warm front is a front behind which warm air is advancing, and a cold front is a front behind which cold air is advancing. So what happens at the warm front, you have warm air moving in, kind of encroaching in the space of this cold air. Well, the warm air is, is warm humid air is less dense, so it begins to gradually rise over the denser, cool, dry air, cool, dry air. So it ascends in altitude more gradually, and so the, it, when, it, when the water vapor begins to um, condense out, it's over a larger area. So you have this widespread precipitation. You don't have any concentrated energy release by the condensation of the water vapor releasing late, latent heat of vaporization. However, at the cold front, the cold air is moving in encroaching on the warm air. Because the cold air is denser, it wants to hug the ground and it forces the warm air up dramatically. So you have all this warm, moist air rising up quickly in all this water vapor condensing out in localized areas, releasing a lot of energy to the upper atmosphere. And that creates stronger updrafts and it fuels the storms. The wind speed increases, winds start blowing faster horizontally to, to, to provide this with uh, more air since this air is rising, it's just a low pressure. And you have all this energy being released in this localized area of the atmosphere, which creates high energy storms. Okay, so basically there's so much water vapor in these clouds that they become dark because light has a hard time passing through them. So it's not that the cloud, a very dark thunder cloud is any different than a, a, a white cloud. It's just that there's much more water vapor in it, so less light is making through it, so it looks dark. But much less, much more not water vapor, but water particles, either ice or, or water itself, usually ice. All right, so in Northern Hemisphere, cyclones, they rotate counterclockwise around low pressure. Uh, and on a large scale, they usually form along the jet stream because you have the cold, dry air from the north coming down and warm, moist air from the, from the south coming up. They collide at the jet stream, the low pressure system it forms this frontal cyclone, warm and cold front advancing. And it tracks along the jet stream. So we often get with this, this line of thunderstorms along the jet stream. Okay. Uh, or in, and you have a line of thunderstorms that forms along the cold front. And so in the northeastern United States, low pressure system moving up the Atlantic coast draws northern cold air and moist from the east. That's a nor'easter. So whenever the, whenever the jet stream is like this and the storm's moving up this way, it's getting cold, dry air from here. It's getting moist air from over here. And that water vapor is what provides the storm all the energy, the latent heat of vaporization. So it can fuel some really large storms that we call nor'easters. So medium scale, um, so the large scale is a frontal cyclone. The medium scale, we have these thunderstorms along the cold front. And on a small scale, we can have tornadoes that spin off of these thunderstorms which we'll talk about. So what is an air mass versus a severe thunderstorm? So air mass thunderstorm are those ones we talked about that, that uh, you know, occur uh, late summer afternoon, result from convection. So what um, happens is that warm uh, humid air is lower density, so it rises. 
and we say it happens in the summer or in the mid latitudes, like where we live, especially late afternoon, but it can they happen all year round in the lower latitudes where there's um, where there's less seasonality. And severe thunderstorms are thunderstorms that will form along cold fronts, uh, mid latitude cold fronts, or cold fronts that form along the jet stream. And the reason why they become severe is because because they're rotating air masses that are moving, they never choke themselves off from their source of energy, like the single mass air storms do. Now, the single cell air storms, they cut themselves off, but supercells or severe thunderstorms, as they're also known, they don't cut themselves off. So they continue to grow in size. And they can spin off tornadoes. So here we have a map showing the uh, number of days each year with thunderstorms. So the warm, moist air that's necessary for thunderstorms usually comes from the Gulf of Mexico. Because remember, it's the water vapor that provides the energy that fills these storms, the latent heat of vaporization, water vapor. The warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico is moving up here. And then you have cold, dry air from the north coming down here, and they collide in this area. So they form these frontal collisions that then cyclones form along, and then you have the thunderstorms. Right, so you can see. Florida has the most thunderstorms, uh, the most, the largest number of days of thunderstorms in the country, from greater than or equal to 100, and then 80 to 99, and then 60, 79. So there's a lot of thunderstorms in Florida. Here we get less than 40, right? Because we're only going to, going to get these thunderstorms at certain times of the year. Where they get them pretty much all year round. Right, so why are there so many more thunderstorms here? Because this is where the warm, moist air, which is the energy that fuels the storm, collides with cool, dry air. It forms the fronts. So thunderstorms wreak havoc in multiple ways. They have the heavy rains, right? There can be flash floods, hail, high-speed winds, straight-line winds, which are basically winds associated with the cyclone, the frontal cyclone itself, or smaller uh, circular winds, with tornadoes. And then lightning caused. Uh, deaths and fires. So, looking at heavy rains and flash floods, um, thunderstorms can be a major supply of water to an area, and if it's over a short period of time, that water can overrun the local drainage uh, from the rivers, and the rivers swell, and they can flood an area. Um, I know, I think it was like 2010, the Patuxent River flooded, and it flooded a lot of uh, a lot of the Area around the Patuxent River, including the Warwick Mall. There are the hail and hail and destructive winds as well. Uh, the hail are these layered ice balls. They're dropped from storms. What happens is the updrafts. Uh, they keep the ice pellets suspended, and as they move up and down, up and down, up and down, uh, they accumulate layer after layer of ice, until finally the pellet of ice is large enough that the updraft isn't strong enough to keep it aloft and it falls down to the ground. So basically the stronger the updrafts, the larger the pellet of ice can get. So the larger the storm, the stronger the updrafts, the larger the hail. So hail is most common in late spring and in, uh, in uh, early summer along the jet stream in the colder mid-continent. So you can see this is a number of major hail storms. And this is time period is 1955 to 67. So we have majority of the hail occurring there. We have destructive winds. So we have straight line winds can be damaging uh, as tornadoes sometimes. So a, a widespread powerful windstorm from a, from a from cyclone sometimes referred to as der, a derecho. These advancing thunderstorms form a line of ferocious winds and uh, can have hurricane force winds lasting 10 to 15 minutes. So for example, uh, in New York and Ontario, in July 1995, thunderstorms, the storm itself was moving 80 mile per hour with 106 mile per hour wind gusts from Ontario to New York uh, for, for a period of two hours in the early morning. So it was very hot, humid air was supplying energy through the night to fuel this uh, storm to the size, to this large size. Tornadoes, on the other hand, are a much smaller scale. We have this rapidly rotating column of air from a large thunderstorm. It spins off a large thunderstorm. 
Uh, it's the highest wind speeds of any weather phenomenon. And they're, uh, they're more actually more intense and, lo and more localized than hurricanes uh, because they are a much smaller scale. About 70% of the Earth's tornadoes occur in the Great Plains of the central US. And they move from the southwest to the northeast because they track along the jet stream, right? With the uh, cyclones that they're forming in. They can travel up to 100 kilometers per hour, with wind speeds up to 500 kilometers per hour, right? And they have a core or vortex that's less than a kilometer wide. It's actually, uh, you know, the, as the air rotates around, around the, uh, the, the tornado moves upward, so it can you know, suck objects up off the ground. So they form hundreds of meters high in the atmosphere. Uh, sometimes it may never touch ground. Um, not all tornadoes touch ground, they could just stay up in the atmosphere. So how tornadoes form is we have to have at least three different air masses moving in different directions at different altitudes. So usually in the United States, what happens is there's warm, moist air from the Gulf coming from the south to the north, cold, dry, mid-altitude Canadian uh, uh, or, or, or Rocky Mountain air coming this way, so cold, dry. And you have the jet stream at higher altitude moving this way. So you have air moving in different directions at different altitudes. And as that warm, moist air from, from the Gulf moves up, it hits the air moving, the air moving in different directions at different altitudes spins it. It creates this corkscrew screw effect. And so the air starts rotating. All right. So another, uh, so we can see how this air is flowing in, the cooler air that's above it. And you get this rotation, this corkscrew effect. And then you get this strong updraft, which turns the corkscrew, the vortex, upward. You get this strong region of, uh, of uh, wind ro rotation. And so here you can see a, our tornado right there. It actually is touching down to the ground. So more about how the tornado is formed. So the thunder cloud is tilted by the wind shear. Right, and so it may grow into a supercell thunderstorm. Because remember, it's a, it's a, it's a front, right? So what happens is you have, um, you have the cold air moving in, and it's forcing this warm air up, and so it's creating creating the clouds. Right? And so it's it's tilted because the air is blowing this way, and this air is blowing blowing this way. It's being forced up. And so these these updrafts and, and these the downdrafts are up here. They they're kind of more separated, so they don't cut each other off. The so rain falls with the downdrafts in the forward flank of the storm. Warm air rises in the updrafts in the middle of the storm. And of course, also cool uh, uh, downdrafts of cool drier air in the back. So you have air moving um, up and down, either up or down, in different parts of the storm. And um, the tornadoes, they form between the middle updrafts and the rear downdrafts. So this is the precipitation. This is the air moving up. This is the air moving down. This is where tornadoes form. So they right, form towards the back end of the storm. The rotation develops in this wide zone. And as the core pulls into a tighter spiral, the speed of the wind increases because of angular momentum. For the same reason why a figure skater where they pull their arms and, and, and legs in, they begin to rotate faster. That's because more angular momentum is being conserved. As the wind begins to rotate and pulls in, it becomes a, 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 a smaller radius vortex, the wind spins, wind speed increases. So in the very center of the vortex of the tornado, there is a downward moving air, uh, but the, the, the upward, upward rotating uh, spiral of air, that's the vortex that we see. That is around that downward moving air in the center. And so the wind speeds of a tornado are the highest, a few hundred meters above the ground. So right at the ground, the wind is slowed down by friction. So uh, when do tornadoes occur in the United States? Well, they occur right around, starting right, right now. This is uh, this is April, mid-April. So late spring, early summer is tornado season. 
And uh, you can see here, this is the average number of tornadoes per year uh, in a, in a, per 10,000 square miles. So they have more than seven tornadoes per year here. You can see this is really, this is what's called tornado alley. Tornado alley. So the tornadoes form here and they track this direction. There's number of tornado days and number of tornadoes. And you can see that the peak tornado season is, is May and June. Uh, and that's because as spring comes and the northern hemisphere begins to receive more solar radiation, if you remember from our last lecture, the specific heat of land is about one fifth of that of water. So the land heats up five times faster than the water. So the air over land becomes warmer and begins to rise, creating lower pressure. And so we have lower pressure over land, so air, air rising over land, which pulls in air from around it. And so some of the air it pulls in is the warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico to the south, and the cold, dry air from the north. And then these two air masses, they, they meet. They meet and they converge forming fronts, forming storms, and the storms generate tornadoes. So that's why the peak tornado season is the spring of the year, because that's whenever the land is warming up much faster than the water around it. And so air is being pulled inland from uh, into inland, and we have all these different air masses converging. So tornadoes are ranked on what's called the enhanced Fujita scale. It used to just be the Fujita scale, and it was a subjective scale. Well, well, technically, I have my dog with me, and she's she wants her toy. Um, so we used to use the Fujita scale, which was based off of the damage. So an F zero is a little damage. F one has roof damage. F two roof is gone. F three, the walls collapse, and so forth. F five would be the largest, where the actual whole house is blown away. The problem then is with this is depending on how you build your structure, if the structure is well built, the resulting the hurricane um, that's right, hurricane the tornado was passed, it'll do less damage, and then it'll rank lower on the Fujita scale, even though it was a large tornado. Where where if a small tornado moves through and you have poorly constructed structures, it would do significant damage and it will be ranked higher on the Fujita, Fujita scale, even though it was a smaller. Tornado. So the Fujita scale is subjective. But the enhanced Fujita scale, EF scale, it goes off of the wind speed. Okay. And so the damage associated, commonly associated with different uh, tornadoes on the EF scale are indicated. Uh, but you can see the wind speed in miles per hour, meters per second, which determines where the tornado is on the EF scale. So an EF5 tornado is an extremely large tornado. Uh, tornado that's very, very, very destructive. So there's three main destructive actions of tornadoes. So first of all, we have the high wind speeds. The wind, they throw debris. Okay? And this debris is like bullets or shrapnel that fly through the air, which is very dangerous. And then also the fast blowing winds, when they blow over a building rapidly, what happens is, uh, due to Bernoulli's principle, whenever the, the uh, velocity of a fluid increases, the pressure in that fluid decreases. So whenever the air is flowing around a house very fast, the pressure in the air decreases, while the pressure inside the air is higher because the air inside the, uh, the pressure inside the building is higher because the air inside the building isn't moving. So that pressure difference, the higher pressure inside and lower pressure outside creates a force that force always goes from high to low pressure. And, and that force ha, uh, sometimes is enough to lift roofs off. So if you've ever seen you know, a high wind speed and it lifts the roof off, that's why. It's really the higher pressure inside the structure pushing the roof up and then the wind catches it and tears it off. And that's what blows out windows too. Windows typically blow out during hurricanes then in because of the higher pressure inside the house. Um, or it's actually not the higher pressure inside the house, it's that the pressure outside drops so much. 
Because remember, low pressure means bad weather. And you have really, really low pressure um, because of the uh, rising, rising, uh, increasing, increasing wind speed. So you can see the in this table from 1920 to 2009, uh, the tornado depth by by decade, and you can see it's been decreasing. And so this declining number of tornado deaths um, is is basically you know we have better technology um, as far as our structures, how we build our structures, how, and then we also have better weather technology where we can um, detect these tornadoes earlier, with better understanding of where they're going to go. Uh, and so we can alert people. And, and also we have, you know, build, uh, as far as our structures, we uh, build, build up structures that withstand hurricane, uh, hurricanes, excuse me, tornadoes, and um, also different things in place. I know I grew up in Western Pennsylvania, we used to have tornado drill, drills, where if there was, um, the, in the drill, we would grab a textbook, you would go to a hallway, it was on the first floor that had no windows in it. Crouch down and hold the hold the textbook over our head. Um, now, if you are if you are in a car, you're actually safer safer than in a mobile home because of the lower center of gravity. Because the mobile homes are often rolled by the by the wind. Um, you can kind of see that in the death tolls by state. This is from 1950 to 2010. So the total deaths. Uh, you see, Texas has the most deaths in Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, Tennessee, and so forth. But the deaths per capita, what that means is if you take the number of deaths and divide it by the population. So Mississippi has the highest number of deaths per capita. That means there's, you know, for example, there's more deaths per thousand people. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I mean, Texas is just a really large state. There's more deaths, but the population is very large. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why there's the most deaths. But population per, per capita, the pop, uh, sorry, the deaths per capita, the deaths, you know, say per every 100 people is highest in Mississippi. So that means you have a much higher, the, you have the higher probability of dying from a tornado in Mississippi, Arkansas, Kansas. And you actually have a really low probability of dying from a tor uh, tornado in Texas, even though they have the largest number of deaths, uh, because the deaths per capita isn't even in the top 12. Why is Mississippi, Arkansas, uh, why, and Kansas, why are those, those states that have highest number of deaths per capita? Well, it's because those are some of the uh, poorer countries, in, uh, poorer states in our country, and there's a lot of mobile housing. And as you can see, uh, a mobile home is the worst place to be in a tornado because a mobile home can be rolled, it can be rolled over by the wind. Uh, then a permanent home, so this is your percent uh, US fatality, so 46% of fatalities were people in mobile homes. 26% were in permanent homes. They're like, well, that seems like a lot. You know, a permanent home, is it that unsafe? Well, just that most people live or are found or are in their permanent home whenever a tornado comes by. Uh, vehicles, 10%, school and churches, 5%, outdoors, 5%, businesses, and unknown. So, but, you know, being in a vehicle is the safer, is, is much safer than a, a mobile home. I would say that being in a permanent home is safer than being in a vehicle. Um, but so if you, you know, ever find yourself in a mobile home and there's a tornado coming through, you're better off going in, uh, into your car. So some case examples of tornadoes. So um, the Tri-State Tornado, March 18th, 1925, the largest known volcano, volcano, let's say volcano, tornado, uh, moved about 100 kilometers per hour through Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana, thus the Tri-State name, giving a two kilometer wide path of destruction, which destroyed 23 towns, Killed 689 people along a 353 kilometer path. So it was an extremely devastating uh, tornado. And so they didn't have the technology in 1925 to track these tornadoes as they do. And there was a super outbreak of tornadoes in early April of 1974. There were five uh, weather fronts. So we have all these five different air masses coming in different directions that collided. Um, 
forming a, you know, a very severe form of cyclones that spun off a bunch of tornadoes. So all the weather fronts came together and the warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico burst up through them. And then, you know, and all the air moving different directions, different altitude, just spun off tornadoes. In about 16 hours, there was 147 tornadoes in 13 different states. And six of the tornadoes were F5 force. There was overwhelming destruction in the region. So one of the worst uh, two days of tornadoes in history. So uh, tornadoes in cities. So 10 out of 36,000 tornadoes between 97 and 2000 struck cities, uh, including Nashville, Salt Lake City, Fort Worth, and Oklahoma City. So you can see the table on the right here, the date, the city, the uh, Fujian scale intensity number of deaths. Uh, so <clears throat> that is always a concern. If you have a large, let's say F5, her, uh, tornado that hits a, hits a major metropolitan area, you have a severe number of casualties. But people in these areas, they have built through houses, um, we're called safe rooms. So, because um, they don't build traditional cellars or basements in modern homes. So what they do is in the interior closet or a bathroom, uh, so interior means it doesn't have an exterior wall, they build the walls of the room out of concrete um, and the roof out of concrete and they put a steel door on it. And so whenever there's a tornado, people will go into the safe room. So they'll go into this particular closet, this particular bathroom that has concrete walls, roof, and a steel door. And so sometimes the entire house is blown away, destroyed, but the safe room is the only thing left standing. And the people are safe in that room. So here's, you know, okay, what to do during a hurricane. If you're in a building, go to a designated shelter, such as a safe room, storm cellar, or basement. There's no shelters nearby, go to a small interior room on the first floor, bottom floor, and put as many walls between you and the outside as possible. Stay away from windows and doors. Get under a heavy piece of furniture so nothing can fall on your head. Do not stay in a building with large expanse of roof, such as auditorium, cafeteria, a mall, manufacturing plant, or gymnasium, because that roof will likely be lifted off. If you're in a, and it's also materials can have, uh, they can, there's a much higher chance of being hit by wind-borne debris uh, in those open spaces. If you're in a car, truck, or mobile home, get out immediately and go to a storm shelter or sturdy building nearby. If in an urban or congested area, do not try to outrun a tornado. If you're caught outside with no shelter, lie down in a nearby ditch or depression. Away from stream beds or power lines, you don't want the power lines coming down. Stream beds, rain can cause flash flooding. So if you're in a stream bed and there's a flash flood, you'll be in trouble. Do not go under an overpass or bridge, right? Because those can actually, uh, th 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 you know, that's, a mis that's a misconception to go on an overpass or bridge. But uh, those often are in stream beds, right? From stream beds, or sometimes they can even fail. So watch out for falling debris. Next, we have lightning. So, lightning is the leading cause of forest fires. And it's a major cause of, which are a major cause of weather-related deaths. Lightning distribution is the same as thunderstorms, as you might expect. And so this map shows us the number of lightning deaths from 1959 to 2009. So we see, you know, really high numbers in Florida. We have a large number of thunderstorms. Rhode Island only had six during that period of time. But the largest number of uh, lightning deaths are where we have the largest number of thunderstorms, which makes intuitive sense. Here we have a map showing global lightning strikes. So you can see in the southeastern portion of the United States, we have a lot of lightning uh, in other parts of, parts of the world too, usually where we have the right conditions. So lightning is caused by uh, electricity flowing. So Excess charge builds up in the clouds and that causes, that induces a charge in the ground. And anytime you have positive and negative charge uh, build up, it creates a voltage. And if that voltage, uh, that voltage becomes large enough, that potential drop becomes large enough, electricity can flow from, from one to the other. And so what happens is as ice, as, as particles of ice are moved up and down by the updrafts and downdrafts, they shatter and they, they create a charge imbalance. They, they cause electrons to be freed 
and those electrons negatively charged particles, they accumulate and they induce a positive charge because they push away all the electrons on the ground. So they induce a, a, a positive charge on the ground. And at that charge buildup between the, uh, the negative charge in the clouds and the positive charge in the ground becomes significant enough, the electrons can actually flow through the, through the air to the ground. Just like whenever you, you know, you drag your, your socks on carpet, you build up excess electrons in your, in your body. So you build an electrical charge in your body. And if you come near something that's metal, it's electrically conductive, the excess charge leaps out of your body to that metal conductive object. It sparks, it's static electricity. It's the same concept, except this charge buildup is much more significant. And so this lightning can travel up to 6,000 miles per second in several strokes within a few seconds. So how lightning works, as I said, there's a charge imbalance from the freezing and shattering of super cold water droplets um, in the clouds. And that separates charge, and that charge, uh, is, is charge separation distributes distributed by the updrafts and downdrafts uh, during the early cloud buildup. So negative charge at the bottom of the cloud induces a buildup of positive charge in the ground below. And the discharge of those electrons in the negatively charged cloud, uh, <clears throat> it begins uh, within the cloud. And you have this downward stream of electrons, the step leader is the actual lightning bolt. As the step leader nears the ground, the ground electric field increases greatly, sending a streamer or positive sparks upward, connecting with the downward sparks. So the lightning doesn't actually strike the ground. The lightning comes down and then a bolt starts on the ground up and they meet above the ground. So why lightning flashes is because the electrical current through the air is so great, so uh, large, it actually causes air molecules to be ripped apart. And when those air molecules ripped apart, it's called ionization. Remember, they reform the energy. Um, so it takes energy, the electrical potential energy rips the air molecules apart. So the energy is put into the air molecules to rip them apart. Remember, the air molecules reform and rebond. The energy is re released in the form of light and sound. So the thunder, the thunder is actually, and the, and the lightning are both the air molecules rebonding after they were ripped apart by the lightning. By the, by the electricity. So the, here's an uh, illustration of the connection of the step leader in the upward streams that complete the circuit. So the lightning starts in the cloud, it comes down, and then you have the lightning uh, begins from the ground and meets above the ground. So, so don't get struck. So lightning can st strike anywhere up to 16 kilometers from a thundercloud. Basically, the area that risk extends to anywhere that the thunder can be heard. And so to avoid lightning, you get inside the house and do not touch anything that's electrically conductive, like plumbing, electrical lines, or telephone wires. So if you're not, you can't get inside a house, get inside a car, do not touch anything. Lightning usually flows along the outside metal uh, frame of a car because it's electrically conductive and jumps into the ground through the tire so it could avoid you entirely. If you're outside, move to a low place so you're not high um, uh, and away from anything tall. Assume lightning crouch, which it's on your ball of your feet. You put your hands over your ears. See, lightning likes to take the path of, the electricity likes to take the path of least resistance, which is the path that's most conductive. Air is not very electrically conductive. So electricity has an easier time traveling through air, uh, sorry, traveling through something else than it does air. So if you're standing on a flat surface, electricity will flow through you. Because if it throws through you, it doesn't have to throw, flow through the, the air. So and it's, it's, a, it's a path of least resistance. And, um, and so that's why if you're in a car, because the metal is so conductive, the electricity just completely bypasses you. It goes into the ground if you're traveling through the car. And if you're not in a car, why you want to go on the balls of your feet? Because the more contact your feet have with the ground, the more electrically conductive you are. And so if you get in the balls of your feet, you reduce your electrical conductivity. And it's important to reduce your electrical conductivity because in uh, physics, we have Ohm's law, which is voltage equals current times resistance. So this, the, the voltage isn't changing. The voltage is you know, the lightning. That's why the, the electricity is flowing. But 
voltage is equal to the product of the current and the resistance. So if the resistance is low, the current is high. And, and current is the actual flow of electricity. And that's what kills you, is the current. So if you can increase your resistance, uh, then your, the current flowing through you will be smaller. Right? And that's what you want, a smaller current. Right? So that's why you want to reduce your conductivity. And finally, we have heat. So heat waves are invisible silent killers. Heat waves have, the, have, have been the biggest killer of all severe weather in the United States in the past 30 years. And the problem with heat is especially significant in cities due to what's called the urban heat island effect. So for example, here is a heat wave in Chicago, July 10th or 19th, 1995. Uh, so here is <clears throat> the, the normal high was 84 degrees, the normal low was 63 degrees. You can see this, the, the, the daily highs. So it went up to 105 degrees, which is a good, what is that? 105 degrees is 84, that's, that's 16. Uh, 16, that's almost 20, you know, a little over 20 degrees warmer than the daily high. And the low, the low of those days was around the daily high. And so here's the heat index. And then here's the deaths. And so you can see that most deaths occur after the peak of the heat wave. Why? It's because the heat is taxing on the body, right? And so it wears down the body because your body is constantly working to try to keep cool. And so when you die from heat stroke, it's after being warm for a, pro a prolonged period of time. So it's not you just you get warm and you die. You get warm, you can't get cool, and your body eventually becomes uh, worn down. And die. So who's at risk? It's mostly elderly pop, uh, population, so uh, people that can't get out of their apartment. Uh, if their apartment's not air conditioned, they're not they're not mobile, and um, and, and, and they just they su suffer from the heat. Uh, so they're at risk, and then also young children, especially babies, because they have a hard time thermoregulating, controlling their own body temperature. So it's really young and the in the older that are most risk, especially. Uh, in apartment buildings and higher levels. So the higher you go, the warmer it is. So in, in, um, in urban areas, elderly populations in, in, in um, apartment buildings in the upper floors, they are the most at risk. So that's why cities will have things like cooling centers or will have a local high school or something where, where people can go to where there will be air conditioning if they don't have air conditioning at their house so they can stay cool. Because if not, people can die. And here we can see the urban heat island effect. So you can see this, G, this satellite image. The green is vegetation. The gray is artificial surface. So buildings or asphalt. And this is an infrared image of the same area. You can say the artificial surface, the asphalt, is much warmer. Why? Well, because the vegetation can absorb, the vegetation can absorb the light without increasing in temperature because it converts, it takes that energy, produces food with it through photosynthesis. And also it's land and water, which can absorb, um, it's, it's, oh, it's water and vegetation, which absorbs that energy without increasing in heat and temperature significantly. Where the asphalt and the concrete, it has low heat capacity, so it warms up very quickly. So the temperature increases very rapidly. Uh, you, you know that if you step onto a, a a parking lot on a hot summer day, it gets really warm. Plus the structures, the buildings, they prevent airflow. So the wind doesn't blow through uh, one of these buildings so that the heat can't escape. The heat just builds up and accumulates. So they try to mitigate urban heat islands by putting green spaces in cities, making green roofs of buildings, or so planting plants and grass on top of a roof, and putting bodies of water in urban areas. So fountains, you know, little ponds, so all those things help mitigate the urban heat island effect. All right, so that's what we have for that lecture. And the exam was posted uh, on Wednesday. You have a week to complete it. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you very much. And this is who you're hearing. Sorry for the disruption. Say so you're sorry. Say so sorry. <laughs>